Alistair McGrath again, talking to you about my textbook, Christian Theology, An Introduction. In the last presentation, we looked at chapter 15, which deals with Christian understandings of the identity of the church, an area of theology usually known as ecclesiology. Yet there is one aspect of the ministry of the church that needs further discussion, its understandings of the nature and purpose of the sacraments. Now, the term sacrament is widely used, and this is, this is sort of a very general definition, to refer to a church rite or ordinance like baptism, which is understood to somehow convey spiritual benefits to its recipients. So this chapter begins by looking at early Christian reflections on the nature of sacraments, noting in particular how the Donatist controversy raised questions about who was entitled to administer the sacraments, and indeed the grounds of their efficacy. Before we need to go any further, I think we just ought to point out that there are a lot of contested questions here, which uh, I cannot resolve in this textbook. How many sacraments are there? What are they called? For example, is the sacrament focusing on bread and wine to be referred to as the Eucharist or the Mass or the Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper? I'm sure you'll understand I can't resolve these disputes, although I do give a very good account of these various issues for you to reflect on and enabling you, I hope, to find your own way to uh, a solution. So let's just note these differences and proceed to think about broader theological issues. In many ways, the important period to look at is the Middle Ages, because during this period, the Western Church made significant advances in sacramental theology. A consensus began to emerge, there were seven sacraments, and there was a very vigorous discussion of the link between the sacramental sign and the things signified. But during the time of the Reformation, the 16th century, much of this consensus was eroded. Now, Protestants, for example, argued there were only two valid sacraments, the Lord's Supper and baptism, not seven. And the Reformation opened up a series of debates about the nature and the function of both these sacraments, with Luther and Zwingli taking very different positions on both. For example, Luther affirms a real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, whereas Zwingli denies it. So this, sacrament, this whole chapter will introduce you to this discussion and give you a very good sense of these historic debates. But of course, the debates continue. And as you'd expect, we look at contemporary discussion of certain issues, including, for example, the nature of the real presence and, of course, baptism. In this case, really focusing on the question of whether infant baptism is justified. So that is a very brief overview of this chapter. Let's now look at it in more detail. We begin by looking at the early development of sacramental theology. I think the point you need to appreciate here is that the New Testament doesn't use the word sacrament at all. It does use the word mysterion, Greek word normally translated simply as mystery to refer to the saving work of God in general, but this word is never used to refer to what we would now regard as a sacrament, for example, baptism. However, it is clear from the history of the early church's um, theological explorations that a connection was made between the mystery of God's saving work in Christ and what we would now call the sacraments. One of the key questions concerns what this word sacrament actually means. The Latin word sacramentum came to be widely used in the Western Church during the third and fourth centuries. And in normal Latin use, the word sacramentum means something like a sacred oath, maybe referring to the oath of allegiance and loyalty to the state that was required of Roman soldiers. And Tertullian, in the third century, used this parallel to highlight the importance of sacraments in relation to Christian commitment and loyalty within the church. For Augustine of Hippo, the defining characteristic of a sacrament was that it was a sign of sacred realities. Yet these signs were not arbitrary. There was some connection between the sign itself and what was being represented. So Augustine says, if sacraments did not bear a resemblance to the things which they're sacraments, they wouldn't be sacraments at all. Now, for example, baptism involves water, which is a sign of cleansing or purification, thus pointing to the cleansing of the human soul through the grace of Christ. Now, the Middle Ages saw Augustine's ideas being developed and consolidated. Hugh of St. Victor in the 12th century offered the following definition of a sacrament. A sacrament is a physical or material element set before the external senses, representing by likeness signifying by its institution and containing by sanctification some invisible and spiritual grace. 
Now that's an important development of Augustine's thinking, which was, I have to say, a little bit vague about exactly which signs counted the sacraments. And Hughes' definition has four basic elements. First of all, a physical or a material element, such as the water of baptism. Secondly, a likeness to a thing which is signified. For example, the water of baptism, as I said a moment ago, can be argued to have a likeness to the cleansing power of the grace of Christ. Thirdly, the sign must be authorised to represent the spiritual reality to which it points. For example, Christ might say, do this in remembrance of me. And fourthly, the sacrament must be able to confer the benefits which it signifies to those who share in it. That's quite a neat definition, but there was something of a problem with it. Because by the 12th century, penance was firmly established as a sacrament, and penance has no material element. And Hughes' definition thus excluded considering penance as a sacrament. So that theory and practice were seriously out of line. And in the end, the theologian Peter Lombard sorted out this problem by proposing a definition of a sacrament which made no reference to any physical or material element. For Peter, a sacrament is simply, and I quote, a sign of the grace of God and a form of invisible grace so that it bears its image and exists as its cause. We then move on to look at the question of what is known as sacramental efficacy. What needs to be done to ensure that the sacrament actually delivers its promised benefits, whatever those are? In the previous chapter, looking at ecclesiology, we considered the Donatist controversy. And for Donatist writers, the efficacy of the sacraments depends on the purity of its ministers. Now, Augustine of Hippo, of course, objected to this, arguing that Donatism laid far too much emphasis on the qualities of the human agent and not enough to the grace of Jesus Christ. And this debate gave rise to two Latin phrases which you need to know because they're widely used in technical discussions of this question. And here they are. First of all, sacraments are efficacious ex opere operantis. Again, ex opere operantis on account of the work of the one who works. Here, the efficacy of the sacrament is understood to be dependent on the personal qualities of the minister. And secondly, sacraments are efficacious ex opere operato, literally on account of the work which is worked. Here, the efficacy of the sacrament is understood to depend not upon the merits of the minister, but upon the grace of Christ which the sacraments represent and convey. So the Donatist position represents an ex opere operantus perspective, whereas Augustine's represents an ex opere operato perspective on how sacraments work. And the second view became normative within the Western Church and was maintained by the Protestant reformers during the 16th century. So this leads us into a discussion of what the sacraments actually do. And the sacraments have multiple functions. And I focus on four main themes in trying to tease out what sacraments actually do. And each of these are illustrated with Protestant and Catholic writers to give you a very good sense of what these issues are all about. First of all, sacraments convey grace. Secondly, sacraments strengthen faith. Thirdly, sacraments enhance unity and commitment within the church. And fourthly, sacraments reassure us of God's promises towards us. So we look at each of those major themes in detail to give you a very good sense of why they're important and also who holds these positions. The remainder of the chapter is then devoted to two specific issues, each relating to the two sacraments that all Christians hold in common, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, and baptism. So we begin by considering one aspect of the Eucharist or Lord's Supper, namely, the question of the real presence. Is Christ really present on this occasion? So the section opens with reflections on some 9th century debates about the real presence, followed by a very interesting discussion on medieval views of the relation of sign and sacrament. And we then focus on four different ways of understanding the presence of Christ, or the real presence, in the Eucharist. Number one, transubstantiation, the view, for example, of Thomas Aquinas. Here, there's a real ontological change in the bread and the wine. 
So they become the body and blood of Christ. Secondly, transsignification and transfinalization. The idea here is the bread and wine don't change ontologically, but they change, if you like, semiotically in terms of what they represent. They don't change physically, but they change in terms of what they mean for us. Then we come to the view of consubstantiation, which is basically Martin Luther's view. The view that somehow the bread and the body of Christ are there side by side. And then there's a real absence, which is the view called memorialism, which we find in the writings of Zwingli. Here, Christ is absent, and what we do in the Eucharist is to remember Christ in his absence. The bread and wine, if you like, are reminders of someone who isn't there. So let's look at two of these in further detail. Transubstantiation rests on Aristotle's distinction between substance and accident. The substance of something is its essential nature, whereas its accidents are its outward appearance, for example, its color or shape or smell. Transubstantiation holds that the accidents of the bread and wine, that in other words, their outward appearance, remain unchanged, whereas their internal substance changes from that of bread and wine to that of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So we look at that view and three others in thinking about approaches to the real presence. Memorialism, of course, is a view linked with Zwingli, and here the idea is Christ is remembered in his absence. Zwingli argues that the creeds affirm that Christ is now seated at the right hand of God, so how can he be present at the Eucharist? How can he be in two places at once? So Zwingli proposes a doctrine of the real absence of Christ so that the Eucharist is about proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again, which comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Christ is absent, but we remember his promise to return. We then move on to look at the sacrament of baptism and we look at three broad options concerning infant baptism. Number one, infant baptism remits the guilt of original sin. Number two, infant baptism is grounded in God's covenant with the church. And number three, infant baptism is simply not justified. The first of these is the view of Augustine of Hippo, and it actually continues to be highly influential. Augustine points out the creeds talk about one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, arguing that this implies that infant baptism remits original sin. But Zwingli disagreed, arguing that infant baptism was analogous to circumcision under the Old Covenant. It was a sign of belonging to a covenant community. And of course, Baptist groups, such as the Southern Baptist Convention in the United States, hold that there is no biblical mandate for infant baptism. Therefore, baptism is restricted to believers. Each of these views is carefully explored and documented. I think you'll find that very interesting. So we cover quite a lot of ground in this chapter, at many points building on material we covered in the previous chapter dealing with the theology of the church. But I felt it was important to separate these two themes out, church and sacraments, simply because it allows us to focus on them in a better way. So thank you for listening, and I look forward to speaking to you again very soon.